Welcome to the Blackhawks Talk podcast with Charlie Romeliotis. I'm Pat Boyle. We are in the virtual podcast studio powered by PointsBet. And look who's with us. Good old number 16. A Hawks legend on the ice and in the booth. And, of course, the lead analyst for TNT. He'll be calling the Stanley Cup final beginning Saturday in Las Vegas. The one and only Eddie Olchek. Ed how are you? PB, Charlie, it's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, had a few days off. I've had as many days off as the Florida Florida Panthers. So uh, hopefully I'll be uh, hopefully I'll be sharp on Saturday night uh, when we uh, bring everybody to Stanley Cup. First time in the history of TNT uh, that they'll have a major championship uh, on our uh, on our network. So really looking forward to being a part of our team's coverage. Everybody's going to be on site. Studio's going to be on site, and of course uh, Kenny Albert and uh, Keith Jones will be alongside so looking forward to uh i would imagine it's going to be an entertaining stanley cup final and when you go to vegas for six days uh you can't beat it so we're uh <laughs> is my old partner back in the day in pittsburgh the great mike lang the hockey hall of famer used to say uh i think i'll be smiling like a butcher's dog when we uh, when we get to las vegas in a couple of days Edzo, you didn't do the Stanley Cup final last year for the first time in God knows how long. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, and and being back, obviously calling it for TNT this year. Well, it was the first time. Uh, this will be my 16th final, Charlie, coming up that I'll be doing. Uh, the first 15 I worked with, obviously the legendary Hall of Famer, the great Doc Emmerich on NBC. And you're right. Last year, uh, I was a fan. I uh, had my feet up. Uh, yelling at my TV, yelling at my buddy Ray Ferraro about, you know, are you going to show that replay? You're going to, you know, come on, let's go. Uh, so I, you know, I was, uh, it was a little, it was a little foreign to me for sure. But, um, you know, as we've said, since the, uh, since the deal happened when NBC left hockey and then ESPN and TNT got together and, you know, they have an incredible relationship with basketball. So it was, you know, two companies that had done business before for the, uh, you know, for the NBA and, um, you know, ESPN did a terrific job last year and we're going to try to do one step better here this year. So it was uh, a little foreign, but uh, I'll tell you what, it was nice to have my feet up and be a fan and, uh, and, and not have all the prep work that goes into doing the Stanley Cup final. But so I, I should be well rested, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can uh, live up to the hype on, uh, on game one on Saturday night. So it's the second trip to the Stanley Cup final for the Florida Panthers. It is also the second in just six years of existence for Vegas. As you mentioned, uh, a long layoff for the Panthers, a week and a half. Do you think, do do you look at that as as being uh, some sort of a a storyline, major or not, going into game one? I would say it is, considering how well that they have played. I mean, they have. I mean, they just, I mean, look at the teams that they took out. And I had this, I don't want to say it was a conversation. It was more of an argument uh, that I had the other day with somebody. And, and you look at the road for the Florida Panthers. Like you could argue before the season started and before the playoffs started, you could argue Boston. Now tell me if I'm wrong. I think Florida played Boston. Yep. They played Toronto. And they just got done with Carolina. You could argue, and I made the argument, is that at the start of the season, those were three of the top six teams in the entire National Hockey League. And going into the playoffs, I think if you would have said, yeah, Boston, Toronto, or Carolina would represent the Eastern Conference, I, you know, I, I don't think there'd be many people that sit there and go, no, nah, I, I, I don't think so. Now, maybe you could argue Toronto just because of, you know, the history of what's gone on with the Leafs. But you look at the path that they've taken. Sergei Bobrovsky, their goaltender now, wasn't the goaltender at the end of the year. He wasn't the goaltender to start the playoffs. Uh, I said it, you know, when I st- when we we jumped on and we started doing uh, we started doing the Panthers. I think we did uh, one of the games against Toronto, and then no, we didn't do a Toronto. I'm saying our crew. I, I'm sorry, I meant our crew. TNT. Yeah. I, I'm said I said like, well, where in the hell was Bob to start the playoffs? Considering. Right. You know, how great he's been. Well, let's fall behind, you know, three games to one and let him get his second game in there. And all of a sudden the guy just goes on a heater. So long winded, just the way that they've played and who they've played PB to the heart of your question. I, I would be a little bit, especially in game one, because look at 
it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a, a point of contention. People are going to be talking about it, and rightfully so. You can only do so much in nine or ten days, and um, so I think game one will probably be the biggest uh, hurdle for them. And then you have two days off, uh, which is kind of odd, you know, when we start the Stanley Cup final where you play on Saturday and then you don't play again for a couple of days. Uh, no, wait, that's the old schedule. No, they're going to play on Monday. So my bad. So forget what I just said. It's going to be Saturday. <laughs> it's going to be Monday. So I would imagine probably Monday I would look to Florida to maybe kind of get back to where they were before. But, uh, you know, who knows with today's athlete and how great condition they are. And if you get a goaltender like Sergei Bobrovsky, the way he's playing, and we said it for many years and I said it with a great Pat Foley and a great Doc Emmerich, if you get it, that being goaltending, you got a shot. In Florida, with Sergey Bobrovsky, they've got a shot. Edzo, that this is probably going to be your X factor of the series. But when you look at what could be the difference for Vegas or for Florida, is it which goalie is better in this series? Is it special teams? Is it a particular matchup? What yeah. could be the difference in this series? Well, let's take the goaltending out of it, Charlie, because if you don't get it, you're not going to win, right? And Aiden right. Hill has had, and he's had a very good season, and he's had an outstanding playoff. Um, but, but I would look at, you know, both these teams do have depth and I'm saying more depth up front than I'm saying on the back end, because I mean, Vegas has a really deep back end. Florida's defense has played really, really well. And I'll just say this, like Florida is their engagement in the offense, I think has taken their game to another level. I think that they've They've tried to do that. They did that under Coach Q. I think they took their game to another level. They had their setback last year when they got swept by Tampa, but it just seems like when they're really playing well, they're pressing up their D are really aggressive, and, and they spend a little bit more time in the offensive zone. But I'm probably going to go inside hockey here. I think when Vegas really plays well, and we saw it in game six of the Dallas series, and I think we've seen in a lot of the games this year, uh, watching Vegas very closely, they can really shut it down on a neutral zone. When, when they do not allow rush chances, like they come on the right side more times than not. So I think that that's where I'll be looking at it. Because Florida, even though they can grind and they like the cycle, and I talked about their deep pressing up, they seem to really get their game going when they are off the rush. They when they struggled early in the Carolina series, they weren't getting a lot of rush chances and Carolina really gummed them up and did a good job. I, I I'm going to look for the area between the two blue lines. I know it isn't really a sexy thing or what have you, but um, you know, wh which team in particular Vegas is, can they really limit the rush chances that Florida can, that has the ability to, uh, to create and, uh, and eventually finish with some of the offensive guys that they have on their team. And so I also look at, like you mentioned, the depth of the forwards on the Vegas. I mean, five of their goals were scored by the bottom six last night. You look at that yep. bottom six, Riley Smith, William Carlson, Amadio, Carrier, Wah, and Colasar, your fourth yep. line. I mean, yep. we, we saw it here in Chicago, those third and fourth line, when you get a contribution like they did yeah. and have received – and you're going up against a very good Florida defense, but but you I think give the edge to the blue liners from Vegas. That could also be a major factor in this series as well. Yeah, the depth. I mean, we, we saw it for for how many years with with the Hawks of, of having, you know, so called third line guys that, you know, quite arguably could have been you know could be second line on on a lot of teams and maybe, you know, with some of the teams it could be number one lines and. When you do have that depth, it gives the coaches, uh, you know, lots of maneuverability, lots of, you know, you got to be able to trust those guys too. Like that's a really important part of it. You got to be able to play those guys and, and trust them. It's just not about, it's just not about scoring. Like when, when your third and fourth lines can score, I would imagine that the, uh, you know, the analytical people and the numbers are, you know, jumping through the gym there. And I think everybody can see it on the eye test. Look, if your third or fourth line scores or your fourth line scores two goals, you should win 99.9% .9 of the games. I mean, that's, that's just the reality of it. So it takes some of the pressure off the big boys. And you're right. Uh, Vegas has been built really since day one of having uh, 
a rotation of four lines. And look, and, and some of those guys, you know, the Waz and the Carriers, you know, those are some bigger bodies, you know, and Colasar, like those guys are, they know their role and, and they're out there to, to stir it up a little bit and, and, and be physical and try to change momentum in games. But when you can get your fourth line to get a couple of goals in a game, you like your chances. So I agree with you, PB, 100% is, you know, that that's certainly when you're doing the uh, tail of the tape or the, uh, you know, the the check mark uh, matchups, uh, you know, I would look at that and, and go, yeah, Ve- Vegas would get my check mark when it comes to the, you know, the depth on the forward position uh, come the Stanley Cup final with Florida. I, I think the best player in the series outside of Bobrovsky, who's as hot as any goalie, obviously, in the world right now, is Matthew Kachuk. Yeah. I, I think going into these playoffs, we thought McDavid, Dreisaitl, Austin Matthews, we wanted to see that star power yeah. in the Final Four or in the Stanley Cup, right? Has this guy entered elite status, superstar status, given what he did in the regular season, but now elevating his game and just being such a massive part of Florida's success in the postseason? Yeah, I... You know, I, I think that's a loaded question, Charlie, on a lot of fronts. But I, I think I, I would agree with you is that I think I think most of us knew how how world class of a player Matthew Kachuk was, not in Calgary, and then following up in Florida, but now getting on the biggest stage. And the, and this is what the best players in the league do: is when the game's on the line, I want the puck on my stick. There are a lot of guys that want to get it and just move it. You know, like they don't want to have that uh, that weight on their stick. But Matthew Kachuk comes from a family. I I played with his dad, Big Walt, for for many years in in, in the Peg in Winnipeg, and the uh, both apples did not fall <laughs> very far from the tree when you talk about Matthew Kachuk and of course his brother Brady, who is in uh, is in Ottawa and is uh is pretty much a duplicate of his of his dad that's for sure so uh let's let's give the primary assist here to uh to matthew and brady's mom uh chantel uh who uh uh you know just i mean just a super talented family the, both the boys are world-class individuals and great representatives of national hockey league but you get on the center stage charlie and like you, you you know, you, you got to step up and, and Matthew has done that. And he does it in, in every possible way, right? Like if the game is not going his way or the team's way, he's going to go right into the blue paint and poke the bear and get people all riled up and excited. And sometimes he crosses the line and yeah, he's going to take a penalty or three. And, but I think it's, it's calculated. He understands how important that can be to change the momentum in a hockey game. And you know, we did on TNT. We did uh, round two. We did Carolina, Florida. We did all. We did all four games. And in game one, that top line with uh, Cousins and Bennett and Kachuk, they had a tough night. You know, and remember that was the four overtime game, and it looked like we were going to five overtimes. And all of a sudden, a quick little play, a turnover by Burns and uh, Slavin. And Matthew Kachuk gets the puck from about, what, 18 and a half feet, and he just goes bar down, and the game's over. That's what great players do. And Matthew Kachuk has turned into – like, I, I mean, we throw that word around a lot, great. But I think in his situation, I, I think we all knew that he was a great player. But when you do it on the biggest stage and in the playoffs and you bring your team to the Stanley Cup final – I don't think there's any doubt you can't use that word. So um, it's not surprising because he did it last year in Calgary. He did it in the regular season this year, but you got to do it in the playoffs. He's done it. And, uh, you know, he, he is the leader of that team. There's no doubt about it. And, oh, by the way, there is a, you know, there is a Blackhawk tie into this on how the Florida Panthers are in the Stanley Cup final, right? Oh, yes. Because the last week of the regular season, and it's been well documented that, hey, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the Blackhawks beat the Pittsburgh Penguins in Pittsburgh, and that allowed the Florida Panthers to get back into the playoffs. And, yeah, they were down three games to one to the Boston Bruins. But, again, Matthew Kachuk, right, when the season's on the line, who did it? So 
we'll we'll see how he steps up again in the uh, in the Cup final, and I'm sure he's going to be all lathered up just like the Florida Panthers and the Vegas Golden Knights will be. Huddle up because it's time to feel the power with PointsBet. PointsBet is giving better 60 days of bonus bets now through the end of May as part of PointsBet's Power Hour. Check the app every day for when your bonus bet is dropping and use it on any same-game parlay. Download the PointsBet app today using the promo code SHYTALK10 and unleash the power of winning PointsBet, your move. It's it's remarkable because a year ago, Florida is wins the president's trophy yeah. and gets ousted, and it's kind of doom and gloom of kind of a you know a failed season, so to speak. They do an about face and acquire Kachuk, and it really changes the complexion of of the team. Um, not only because of, of what he provides, but the style of play that he fits so well in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Something yeah. you know from from his father. Yeah. Well, look, I, when that trade happened, you know, my initial thought was, like, Florida is all in to change the makeup of their team to bring a different dimension where, and I did the series last year against Tampa when Tampa took them out in four games after having an unbelievable season. Like they got punished and they decided, you know what? Yeah, we're going to give up a guy like Uyghur who, you know, I, I think is a, you know, is a good defenseman. I mean, I think he's a legit four or five. Jonathan Huberdo, I mean, he's been a great, uh, he's been a great regular season player. He didn't have a great season, obviously, last year. Uh, he came out publicly and pretty much blamed Daryl Sutter for the season that he had, which, okay. So now all the pressure is on Jonathan Huberdo this coming season to, you know, to have a good year and justify the, you know, whatever, you know, 75 mil, you know, schmill that he got in his contract from the Calgary Flames. So when the trade happened, I was just like, okay, look at it. They're all in like this is, they, they need to find a guy that is going to drag everybody into the fight PB. And, and, and that's what Matthew Kachuk has been able to do. And those guys are hard to find, but, you know, I think a lot of people thought, well, geez, you know, if Florida gave up a lot and whatever. Well, when you look at the trade now, uh, no, no, yeah, right. Calgary, Calgary probably should have got more. Right. I mean, I, when you really look at it, because these trades are not about, you know, air quotation, a lot of the times they're not, you know, they're not judged maybe two or three years down the road. But when you look at established players, you sit there and go. No, no, we're, I'm judging this and going, yes, yeah, landslide, Florida without a doubt, right? And we all know what happened in Calgary. So, yeah, Matthew Kachuk is a different, uh, different breed, and uh, yeah, he, uh, like I said, I, I know his, I know his dad very, very well, and uh, you know, like I said, that apple, uh, that apple fell right down next to the bottom of that stump because he, him and his brother are. Uh, you know, uh, they're just like their dad. And, uh, and and anybody that didn't see Keith Kachuk, look at I believe he's a Hockey Hall of Famer. Uh, I hope that big wall gets in there. I think he deserves to be in a Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, but these, uh, you know, these Kachuk boys are, are pretty special. And Matthew's got his chance to, to do something, uh, you know, to do something his dad wasn't able to accomplish. And that's when it's Stanley Cup. Edzo, changing gears really quick. Talk to us about year one in Seattle it, in the broadcast booth, but also yeah. following a team that maybe shocked the hockey world by going <laughs> as far as they did in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look at it. I mean, change is never easy. Uh, you know, I mean, I've said this before. I mean, I always thought that I would be at home for the rest of my life, but sometimes things happen and decisions are made. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so proud of, of, of everything that uh, I've been associated with the Blackhawks and always will be. And, and uh, gave everything I had to, you know, the team as a player, as a broadcaster, somebody in the community. It'll always be home. And, you know, going out to Seattle, obviously a huge family tie there. You know, with my brother Ricky there in the front office with Ronnie Francis. And my son Eddie is an amateur scout. And and then Nikki, you know, jumping in on the broadcast and and, and, and doing pre and intermissions and post games in, in Seattle. So, and look, I, I had worked with Johnny Forslund before. Um, Johnny Forslund is a national broadcaster through and through. He's as good as there is. And, 
to get a chance to work alongside him for the first time on a local side. And, you know, he come from a situation where he was in Carolina for, you know, 25 years. And, and uh, unfortunately for him, he got shown the door and, and ended up on his feet a year after and, and is in Seattle and, and then working with JT Brown, who I've known since he was 18 years old, playing in the USHL in Waterloo, Iowa for the Blackhawks and uh, play with my older son, Eddie. So I've known JT a long time. And, um, you know, I think last, you know, two seasons ago for Seattle, yeah, I know they ended up with 60 points, but they, you know, they probably weren't a 60 point team. You know, I mean, they didn't get goaltending and they had a lot of injuries, Charlie, but to see a 40 point improvement, uh, all the moves that Ronnie Francis made in the uh, in the off season, and then in the uh, regular season, picking up Ellie Tolvin from the Nashville Predators, who could never even get in a lineup, let alone get in a top six role. And you know he scores what 21, 22 goals and has a great playoff. So, um, but it was I mean look, it ended up being a, a great experience, a lot of fun. You know it's always fun when the team is winning, but at the end of the day, you got a job to do when you're in the broadcast booth and. Uh, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I miss home. Like I said, it's, you know, it's always going to be home, but, uh, it was a, uh, an exciting season and I'm happy for ownership in, in Seattle and, and, and happy for, you know, for Ronnie Francis and my brother for, you know, for all the legwork that they did and, uh, and having the season they did and look at, they went to seventh, they went to seventh game in the second round against the Dallas stars. So a uh, big improvement there. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun, but uh, like I said, change can be some trepidation. It could be scary at times, but uh, I thought it was a very good first year and uh, hopefully I'll have me back for a second year. So we'll see what happens. Well, you've got one of the best jobs in hockey. Um, you, you know, you're going to call your 16th Stanley Cup final coming up this Saturday, starting that off in Vegas. Uh, your name has been mentioned in cities where there have been hockey ops openings in, in, in recent months. Has watching your brother and what Ronnie has done in Seattle, building a team from scratch, so to speak, has it increased your appetite to want to get back into to hockey ops? Well, I mean, I've always said since I had that opportunity to coach PB and Charlie uh, in Pittsburgh back, uh, it's hard to believe, some 20 years ago, um, you know, there was always that, uh, you know, that emptiness or that uh, that feeling to want to be a part of for sure. But, you know, look, at, I, I will say this is, you know, you can't you can't always believe what you hear and what you see. I'll just, you know, I'll, ju I'll just leave it at that. OK, um, I. Over the years, yeah, I've had, you know, I've been interviewed and have had deep conversations with a few clubs and, you know, nothing has materialized, but um, I love what I do. Uh, I, I love, I'm very much at peace, you know, I mean, you guys know that I went through my battle uh, five plus years ago and uh, feeling good and, 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 and enjoying, you know, the people that I work with, the teams that I work on as far as broadcast teams and TNT and in, in, in Seattle now. So, um, but I think there's always that, you know, that, uh, that wonder, so to, uh, so to speak, PB, to the heart of your question that, you know, is there, uh, you know, will there, or is there an opportunity? And if somebody calls or knocks, certainly I do talk to a lot of people, a lot of, you know, uh, all the time, because that's, that's what I do. So, um, you know, look at it. if something presents itself and, it comes to fruition. Great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a really good place right now. And, uh, um, you know, sometimes it, it, sometimes, uh, you know, you would like to just, sometimes you're, how do I want to put this? Sometimes you're just associated just because you have ties to certain cities and, you know, have interviewed in places before and, you know, people talk and what have you. So there's, there's some things you can control and some things that you can't. So sometimes it's just better off to, uh, you know, be like an ostrich and just go ahead and bury your head in the sand and, uh, and uh, not try to uh, have any retorts or anything on, on what's going on. Because at the end of the day, if something happens, it'll happen. If it doesn't, then, uh, you know, you just kind of turn the page. Right, last one for you here, Edzo. We can't let you leave without asking a Blackhawks question. Sure. You mentioned the Blackhawks beating 
the Pe- Pittsburgh Penguins, how yeah. that helped Florida, but it also helped them somehow it, win the lottery, right? Y- you were obviously at the beginning stages of the rebuild with Chicago way yeah. back when, when they got Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves. Right. For them to be able to check the box of getting a generational type talent, what does that do for the Blackhawks moving forward? And how important is that for the trajectory of this rebuild? Well, I mean, it's obviously huge. You know, I mean, I, you know, being a part of the, you know, the the GM search and the committee with 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 Haas, with Marion Hulse and Sharpie, with Patrick Sharp, uh, you know, last year, kind of, you know, having an idea of the plan and and you know how they're going to, you know, kind of build this thing. And, and, and I think Kyle and Normie are, are doing it right and planning it right. And, you know, you look at, I mean, all, I think all the teams that were at the, at the bottom last year were hoping to have that ability to get the number one pick and, and, uh, you know, and have a chance at, uh, you know, either expediting the, uh, the rebuild or at least have that, uh, that piece in there that, you know, that you're going to be able to build around. And, and I think it's so important. And look at, and I, I just speak to experience and, and, and because I lived it when I was in Pittsburgh, when I was coaching in Pittsburgh. And at that particular time, we were in a rebuild and we traded pretty much every asset. And, and uh, it was about making sure is that you, when you do have players coming in like a Mark Andre Fleury or an Evgeny Malker and there a Sidney Crosby, is that you surround those guys with veterans that are not on self-led agendas. And they have to be there in the good and the betterment for the franchise and for the organization moving two, four, five years from now. Maybe not necessarily for them individually at that particular time, but you got to make sure that you surround those type of players. And, And I think that we did that now. Some guys, I think, were a disappointment. Other guys were obviously grand slams. Is that you got to have the right guys around th- those generational players that you think are going to come in and to be able to help them and show them and protect them both on and off the ice. And um, that's such an important part of, of a rebuild and in, in understanding of knowing where you were. And obviously three cups in five or six years, whatever it was. And then having some difficult times for a while and and then now looking at the plan and, and knowing where you are and where you're trying to get to, having those right guys in that room to go about the business is, is such an integral part of building a team and building a franchise. They're hard to find. You might have to overpay. You might have to take a guy on, you know, an expiring contract just to get that guy in there. Like I think about like the first guy that comes into my in my mind is 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 Marty Lapointe, right? Like when you talked about Charlie, when you talked about Kaner and Johnny, right? Like the first guy that comes to mind to me is Marty Lapointe. And I said this publicly and I said this during our broadcast for many, many years. Like I wish I had the chance to play with a guy like Marty Lapointe. I would have loved to play with a guy like Marty Lapointe. Um, playing against him, tried to try to stay the hell away from him, you know, because he's just he had that ability. But um you know, guys like that are such an important part to building a successful team. It doesn't mean you're going to win. You know, and that, that doesn't mean it. But I think it's really important for those young guys that you bring in and the guys that you think are going to be the guys carrying the mantle for a long, long time to allow those guys to observe guys like that is such an important part of, uh, of building that. You know, culture is a big word in sports today, but it is uh, – it, it, it's helping birth the, the culture when you do have the right veteran guys in there that are on the agenda of the franchise, not necessarily individually. And uh, it pays to have those guys there. So uh, look, at it. it's great for the, obviously it's great for the city. It's great for the franchise. It's great for the fan base. And uh, you know, we'll see how it all plays out and uh, uh, we'll see what Kyle and Normie decide to do here moving forward. Edzo, we always appreciate the time you take to join us. Have a great call with Kenny, with Keith Jones, Liam and the studio crew. Don't do too much damage at the Red Rock <laughs> Casino. And, uh, and we'll enjoy watching you guys the next couple of weeks as you put a bow on this NHL season. Yes, the Red Rock Resort Casino and Hotel, the 
hotel choice of yours truly. That is that is correct. So it's always great seeing you guys. I miss seeing you guys every day, and I uh, love you. Hi to the families and uh, Charlie, a belated uh, happy 29th birthday. I understand. So yes, uh, that's U.S. right? 29 U.S. and 31 Canadian, or correct the other way around? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yep. All right. You're Be right. Good, guys. Take it Thanks easy, Edzo. And that's going to do it for the Blackhawks Talk podcast.